I, Naman Agrawal, the student manager of Shibalaji Society, feeling privileged to introduce to you all the towering personality, Mr. Paul Doctor. Sir has completed his graduation from Neswadia College of Commerce, Pune. Sir has worked with three of the erstwhile big five professional service firms and has 34 years of experience in serving clients in a range of industry on internal audit, risk management, corporate governance, and external audit, of which 29 years have been with professional service firm in India, Singapore, the United Kingdom, Europe, and Middle East. In addition, Sir was CFO for the diversified group in pharmaceuticals, engineering products, financial services, and information technology for five years. His principal areas of expertise include financial service, consumer business, manufacturing, shipping and transportation, media entertainment, and logistics. Sir is a global leader, internal audit, Asia Pacific region for Deloitte, and has led the Deloitte India internal audit practice for 12 years. He is currently the CFO prog program leader for India. Now, I request Poru Sir to share his views with us. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. I'm going to spend the next uh, 60 minutes talking to you about some of the disruptive technology trends in the 21st century, something that I'm sure is very close to all of your hearts. So let me start with a quote by Alvin Toffler. Um, it says that the illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read or write, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. Here are some statistics to absolutely blow your mind. These companies were market dominators not that long ago, and they don't exist today. BlackBerry, market leader at one point of time, today just struggling to stay afloat. Compaq, Polaroid, Borders the Book Company, Woolworths, Blockbuster, the movie company. And of course, all of you may have heard of Nokia. A decade ago, the most sought after phone. Today, you'll have to hunt to find it. Think about Polaroid. Path-breaking company. Disrupted the, the, the photography industry with instant photography. You press a button, take a photograph, and out comes the, the version of the photograph. And with digital photography, it's almost become extinct today. Look at borders. It had changed the way people went to a bookshop and bought a book. It created the concept of a cafe inside a bookshop. So you can actually pick up a book, read through a few pages, you know, get a feel of the book. If you like it, buy it. It doesn't exist today. It was a market leader 15 years ago. Look at Orkut. Path breaker before Facebook. And Facebook has completely destroyed it. Nokia. The Nokia 1100. The world's largest selling phone. 250 million phones sold. Has sold its plant in Finland. The flagship plant of Nokia because it can't sustain business anymore. It's been completely disrupted. It did not change to the current times. It did not change to the smartphone technology. And it's been obliterated by Apple and Samsung. Look at BlackBerry. There were times when we had people who were BlackBerry addicts walking along on the paths, two hands on the phone, the QWERTY keyboard. Who uses a BlackBerry today? Well, I'm sure one of you might in this audience but I'm sure that person won't want to raise his or her hand, right? Only those companies who fully embrace technology will sustain in the future. The rest of those companies will not exist. And they have already, in many cases, exited. Look at the Fortune 500. All of you must have heard of the Fortune 500 companies? Okay, hands up. 
out of the 500 companies in the early 60s, how many of you think 300 of those companies exist today? By a show of hands. 200. 150. 100. 75. All those who haven't raised their hands now can raise it because it's only 60 companies. <laughs> only 60 of the top 500 companies in the world exist today. That's reality. It is also very significant to note that of these 60 companies, of the 500 companies today, the majority of those companies are technology-oriented companies. So whilst you had hitherto the General Motors and the General Dynamics and the GEs of the world, today you have the Alphabet Google, you have Microsoft, you have Apple, you have Uber. These are today's companies, the companies of the future. And by the way, all of them are technology-oriented. They are not telecom companies. They are not IT companies. They are not banking companies. They are technology companies. All of them with a heavy bent towards technology to survive today and in the foreseeable future. And the fact that nine out of 10 companies in 1955 are off this list indicates that market disruption, the significant churn and creative destruction has impacted business like never before. The market disruption is driven by a relentless focus on revenue and profits, a competition on low prices, high quality products, and outstanding customer service. Customer service that is so demanding and so fickle. The customer has become so fickle that it will change from one company to the other based on their likes and preferences. And therefore, these companies have to raise the bar on both customer service as well as their, their bent on technology to be able to service the customer of the future, which by the way is this room. All of you are the customers of the future for these companies. What are some of the biggest challenges that these Fortune 500 companies face today? The CEOs, CEOs of these Fortune 500 companies in a survey that was carried out uh, have said that the number one challenge that they face, 72% of the Fortune 500 CEOs have said the number one challenge is the rapid pace of technological innovation. 72%. 66% say that whilst there is technological innovation, there is also a cyber risk attached to it. All of you have been hearing these days about theft of data. It's no longer theft of money. It's about theft of data, which is probably more valuable than money because the kind of data that you can steal and sell to another customer brings about the kind of money that is unimaginable today. So that's why data has become so valuable and data privacy has become so important to us today. And by the way, when we say data privacy and data, data capture and data privacy, think about it. When you buy a new phone, okay, all of you, honest answer, when you buy a new phone and you have to log in for the first time and there is 77 pages of a contract that you have to say, I agree. How many of you read those 77 pages and actually agree? Or you just press the word, I agree, and get on with the phone? <laughs> Do you realize what you signed up for? Well, that's the risk. That's the risk, and on page 67 of that 77-page document, you might find one word which says, we have the right to all your data. But we all sign up, right? You can't use the phone if you don't agree. And that's the risk we run today. 61% of CEOs said there is an intense pressure on increased regulation. And as Indian companies, and I'm now talking about Indian companies, not all of them are Fortune 500 companies, we hope one day they will, but Indian companies feel the pressure even more as we expand outside of India. 
as Indian companies go global in their quest for increasing the size of the business, the size of the pie, and for becoming global dominant giants, the regulations in those countries start to hurt them more and more because compliance with those regulations is mandatory. It's table stakes. It is not optional for them. And therefore, that becomes an increased challenge as well as an increase excuse me, an increased cost for them, because there's a cost for regulation. There is a global shortage of skilled workforce, skilled labor, a global shortage. We are a com country of 1.3 billion and growing, and yet there is a dearth of good talent in this country. And that's why you, students, should never stop learning because tomorrow's world will require skilled workforce. People who are used to doing the routine work will not have jobs. And I'll tell you why they won't have jobs in the next few slides. But automation, robotic processes, are taking over this world by storm. They are taking over our country by storm. I'm not sure in you, if you know in your very own city how many robots have been deployed at the workforce, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, no sick leave, no annual leave, no leave at all, no gratuity, no pension, nothing. A machine that just keeps on doing work at 97.85% accuracy, far beyond what we would expect human beings to do. So you need to be super skilled in tomorrow's world to survive. You need to keep upgrading your skills. It's not enough to get a degree and then stop. You need to keep upgrading that because that degree will be obsolete five years from now, 10 years from, <coughs> from now. The world is doubling its knowledge base every five years and you have to ask yourself how much of that is actually being imbibed by you. How much of your knowledge base is increasing every five years in order to simply survive? In terms of an ecosystem, and I'm alluding to the previous speaker's point on, on diversity, 4.8% or 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs today are women, which is at a record high. 17% of Fortune 500 CIOs are women. CIOs are chief intelligence or in information uh, officers. 20% of the Fortune 500 CEOs believe the startup is their most dangerous competitor. 20%, one in every five CEOs believes a startup will ultimately disrupt them. The youngest CEO in the world of the Fortune 500, I'm sure a lot of you use his product. Yes? Good. And I think from an Indian perspective, I think it's, we are really proud that we have three Indian CEOs in the Fortune 10 companies. Three Indian CEOs. Of Indian origin, born in India, studied in India. Very proud thing, right? Here's a more alarming statistic. Whilst it took 70 years to disrupt the previous 500 companies, it is going to take 10 years to disrupt the next 500 companies. One decade from now, it is expected that 40% of today's 500 companies will disappear. Now that's the alarming speed of which disruption is taking place in this world. So you see the accelerated pace, right? It used to say that you know, there used to be a disruptive technology coming up every 15 years. Then it became 10 years, then it became five years, three years, one year. We are now projecting disruptive technology will happen every six months. And that's a short-term projection. There are some who believe it will happen every three months going forward. So who are the new kids on the block? Who are the companies we have come to now respect today and in the future? And by the way, most of them did not exist in the previous list of 500 companies. Here's the first one, WhatsApp. Who doesn't have WhatsApp on their phone? 
I would imagine 90% of you would, 99%, I see no hands going up, almost 100%. What about Uber, right? Disrupted the auto, auto industry completely. Fascinating story. The world's largest auto company does not have a single asset. An asset light entity is the world's largest auto company today. Look at Facebook. Millions and millions and millions of users today. Alipay, which is a subsidiary of Alibaba. The Android. Square. LinkedIn. Apple. Apple, by the way, disrupted the US telephone industry like nothing else has. 10 years ago, nobody even thought about using an Apple phone because it was costly, it was a new technology, it required uh, a different charger, <laughs> so people could not uh, substitute other chargers. It required a lot of other stuff, right? iTunes and, and, all, and all that stuff. And today it's become a way of life. It's taking over the world by storm, the world's most valuable company today. Instagram, YouTube, Airbnb, world's largest hotel company, not a single room. It owns. Asset light entity, world's largest hotel company. Twitter. We see prime ministers and presidents today tweeting on Twitter, right? Look at Amazon. How has it disrupted your business today? It has disrupted our life today, right? We can sit at home and order anything you want based on Amazon or the Indian version of it, Flipkart, or so many other you know, similar e-commerce uh, platforms. That's just disrupted the world. It has disrupted a lot of manufacturing companies who now believe a lot of their future business is going to come through these platforms, e-commerce platforms. You cannot avoid it. It's there to stay. It has disrupted. Alibaba, Google Chrome, and in our own country, Paytm, has changed the way we bank, right? Become so convenient, transacting on a fingertip with a smartphone. Geo completely disrupted the telephone business in India by making, you know, domestic calls free. And by the way, Jio itself was probably disrupted because you had things like Skype, WhatsApp, uh, you know, the, the phone calling device on WhatsApp, which again was anyway free, right? Why in India? You could call anyone anywhere in the world with that. FaceTime on an Apple, you could actually see the person and, and have a conversation with that person free of cost, just using a, you know, Wi-Fi connection. So that's what's been happening in this world. That's how the world has been disrupted. I think um, I'm just going to skip through all of this and go straight to one very wise man called Bill Gates, who says, never before in history has innovation offered promise of so much to so many in such a short period of time. He says, innovation promises so much to everyone in a very short period of time. That's what innovation has done. Here are some of the technological advancements guiding our way into the 21st century. And, and think about some of these. these some, some of these may be absolutely bizarre concepts for you. But they are, by the way, all of them reality. Bluetooth, of course, everyone knows. It's disrupted business. We're talking about 5G now. So 4G is already history, disrupted by 5G. Interesting, right? We've just gotten used to 4G. It's no longer technology. It's obsolete. It's 5G now. Virtual reality. How many of you experienced virtual reality? Some of you have. Driverless cars, Teslas of the world, Google cars. I've seen demos of these cars. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The way they can maneuver through two cars with six inch gaps. You know, as, as reasonable drivers, I don't think we could do that very, very skillfully. Electric cars. The new concept of 3D printing. Anyone seen 3D printing in action? You have. 
Unbelievable, right? I saw a demo of uh, 3D printing where they could print, where they could create an airplane component. Airplane component of a 3D printer. Unbelievable. So now the next challenge is how to speed it up because it takes a fair, fair amount of time to actually uh, create one product. But the thing is now, how do you replicate that? How do you come up with mass production of those products? That's the next challenge, and I'm sure within the next five years, that will be resolved as well. Bluetooth, wireless transfer of information between two or more devices. No need of having add-ons like I've just added on my pen drive to project this. High-speed internet, like I said, 5G now. The average, just, just, just for a statistic, uh, since we are used to about um, an average of um, 6 Mbps in India, Singapore is 156 Mbps average. So it <laughs> just staggers you, right? We think 6 is ultra-fast in India. Singapore average is 156. Hong Kong is 140. South Korea, which by the way has the highest penetration, uh, it's got almost 100% penetration of, of um, uh, broadband, has got 126. India uh, commercial is about 15 to 17, but the average for, for most of us is probably, I mean, on your phones you probably get two, right? If you're lucky. Okay, virtual reality. It helps in learning training and connecting people. It's currently largely used by militaries across the world to train soldiers with immersive experiences in technology. Um, it's also used by the um, airline industry to create virtual experiences. And uh, some of those actual virtual experiences have helped pilots in real life situations in a crisis. Driverless cars, here to stay. By the way, think about one concept all along as we speak, and that is each of these are actually taking away jobs, right? So what's a driverless car going to do? Take away jobs, you're right. Electric cars, fuel efficient, pollution free or, or reduced pollution, and today, Remac has actually come up with a, a full charge that can take you 500 kilometers. That means you can go to Bombay and come back on one full electric charge. You don't have to look for a place to plug in anywhere on the highway. One charge will take you to Mumbai and back. Fantastic, right? I spoke about 3D printing. I'm going to talk about one very unusual thing that happened just 15 days ago in China, by the way. A dental surgery was carried out using 3D printing where the surgeon, where the, where the robot actually, not even the surgeon, there was no hand involved in it. The robot implanted two teeth in a, in a lady using 3D printing like this. The margin of error was better than a human dentist could have done. A human dentist would have had a margin of error of 0.04 to 0.05. The 3D printed robotic surgery carried out had a margin of 0.03. Unbelievable. By the way, think again. Perhaps some other jobs may go here. Right? If you have a highly skilled robot, that can actually carry out minimally invasive surgery on you with a margin of error lower than most, well, 99% of what surgeons could do anywhere in the world, who would you rather go to? I know you're not, still not comfortable with the machine you know, operating on you, but think about it. If it's proven beyond doubt that this is a safer, more effective method, I'm sure at some point of time you will start thinking about it, right? I'm sure of it. It'd probably be a cheaper method as well. 
over a period of time when everyone gets one of these robots to uh, carry out these surgeries. Look at what digital transformation has been doing. I think the biggest transformation we've seen in the decade certainly has to be smartphones, right? We can't live without them today. A lot of you actually use it at every hour of the day. Even sitting in these sessions, I'm sure I can see a lot of people with their heads down, obviously looking at their phones. Video communication has taken away jobs from the travel industry. I don't today go to Delhi for a two hour meeting because I can have a video conference with my colleagues out there, with a the client out there. So much more efficient, real life situation. You can see the person, you're almost uh, visualizing what, what they are doing. You can see the whole room, you can see the whole table in front of you. You can have a conversation. A lot of my interviews I carry out on video conference. Have the candidate sit in front of you at any remote location anywhere in the world. Social media disrupted our lives again. Not sure if it's for the better, but certainly, I mean, it's, I, I don't know about you, but someone from my generation uh, has brought together a lot of old friends um, on social media, people you probably had lost contact with. And suddenly you find a surfeit of people who you're trying to just sort of vaguely recollect where you had last met them. Uh, now you're best friends on social media. Data analytics, and I'll come to data analytics in a bit, and blockchain. Artificial intelligence, another hugely disruptive technology that has come into play. Robotics I've spoken about, I've shown you a couple of examples. The cloud. By the way, another area where you've got to be extremely careful about what you put up. Because data in the cloud can be accessed by others. And there is no privacy out there. So be very careful what you share that can be shared to others as well without your knowledge most of the time. So the cloud is a brilliant technology. A lot of corporates are actually moving towards the cloud and trans transferring and transmitting billions of bytes of data out there. But there is a risk attached to it and we need to see how we can best manage that risk. IoT or the Internet of Things and finally, a new concept that's now gaining momentum is cryptocurrency. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about bitcoins, right? Some of you may already be trading in them. Yes, very good. You're rich people today. Because that cryptocurrency, and I'll show you some statistics as to what fortunes people have made out of it. So clearly, I think, without doubt, um, smartphones have been immensely disruptive, right? We can, in most countries, you can actually operate out of home using a smartphone today. It's like an office on the move. If you have an iPad and a smartphone, well, you don't need anything, you don't need a laptop today. If you're reasonably digitally savvy. The app economy in the year 2020 is expected to be $100 billion. Think about it. The apps that you buy for 100 rupees and 200 rupees, that business is going to be $100 billion by 2020 which means if you aggregate all of the apps in the world today, in 2020, it'll be in the Fortune 10 companies. That's the power of social media, smartphones, and the complete dependence by every one of us on these technologies. I've spoken about Skype and WhatsApp, and I'm sure a lot of you who've got friends and relatives um, out of Pune, uh, must be using this on a day-to-day -day basis, and not necessarily only Skype and WhatsApp, but I'm saying similar technologies, um, because it's just completely taken away the home phone concept, right? 
How many of you don't have a landline today? There you are. I, and I rest my case. This is exactly the response I expected from this room. I was talking to the CFO of one of the largest companies in India. And he told me, you know what? My wife and I have decided not to have a landline. I said, does it work well for you? He said, yeah, I've got my cell phone, she's got hers. We're good. You don't need a landline today. Who uses a landline today? Very few. Social media, again, massively disruptive. I'm actually certain that social media has actually even disrupted the business environment because it has taken away productive hours out of business. And so a lot of companies today actually monitor the use or your use of social media during office hours. And if you reach a particular threshold in terms of time spent on social media, well, you certainly get a very interesting letter. Data analytics. How many of you have familiarize yourself with the concept of analytics in this room? Not too many? Some. So what is data analytics? It is the power of, for want of a better word, manipulating data to predict results, to predict outcomes. For example, when you buy something on Amazon, do you realize that, can I just put this light off one second? Do you realize that when you buy something on Amazon, there is a pattern of your trend noticed out there, and the next time you go there, it will show you similar products that you can buy. That's through the power of analytics. So whenever you use an e-commerce platform, someone is tracking what you're looking at. By the way, even what you've browsed and not bought, because you've shown interest in that product, right? So that becomes a pattern for them. So they, for example, they will say in the city of Pune, there is an extra requirement for a particular product. And so they will start giving you huge discounts or clubbed, clubbed opportunities to go and buy those products because they sense there is a buying pattern that they've noticed out there. And these patterns are, by the way, being thrown up every five minutes now. So you log into Amazon, log in after five minutes, you'll find your current pattern being picked up and analytics being used to tell you, projecting to you what you should be buying. So 10 years ago, it used to be on historical data. So therefore, we call it the hindsight, based on hindsight. Today, it's about current data, about insight. And we are seeing the future of analytics going into foresight, which means predicting the outcome. So using analytics, you can predict the outcome in certain companies of where your future trends are going to be, where the sales are going to come from, which markets you're going to emerge from. I can use the power of analytics to go to a smart screen. And by the way, today, global boards are actually using these for presentations, where you have a smart screen, a touch screen, where you can go there. Say, for example, you look, you're in the US. You see the map of US. You can get a heat map there in terms of a red color on certain areas that need to be looked at. Just go to the smart screen out there, touch it. You can deep dive into a city, a particular store in that city, and a particular employee in that store in that city who is doing something that is out of the ordinary as far as business is concerned. So that's the power of analytics, and that's the speed at which you can today predict outcomes, be it business um, you know, revenue models, or be it um, certain anomalies that you're noticing which need to be investigated further. Blockchain. This is going to significantly disrupt business as never before. It is a distributed general ledger which cannot be tampered with and protects data to a significant extent as compared to other channels that uh, you know use uh, high bytes of data. We have seen blockchain today being used for virtual wallet and payments. We're seeing it being used significantly for process payments and clearing and settlement solutions. And it is the 
favored platform for cryptocurrency denominated products. Artificial intelligence. It is the defining technology of the 21st century as the microprocessor chip was in the 20th century. So this is going to be the technology around which most technologies will evolve. Google uses machine learning. It auto-completes your search queries, right? That's artificial intelligence. It often accurately predicts, and sometimes inaccurately predicts, what you're looking for. Facebook, Amazon, like I said, use predictive algorithms. They make recommendations based on what you have, what you have seen, what you have been searching for. And by the way, not just what you've bought, but what you've searched for. Remember that. That's very important. So every time you look at a product in the artificial intelligence system, that is something that they feel you're going to be, at some point of time, looking to buy. That's the beauty. That's the power of what artificial intelligence is all about. It also, also can detect and defend against digital security breaches and plays a very critical role in protecting user privacy and building trust. Robotics. Enough said about this already. In the manufacturing industry, military, space exploration, transportation, medical applications in India, in the shared services businesses, robotics has become a way of life. So whilst you use robotic process automation, what we call bots, B-O-T-S, bots. And by the way, I don't know how many of you are even aware that very often when you call a helpline, you're not talking to a human being. You're talking to what is called a chatbot, which is programmed with about 500 to 1,000 common questions. And it will sound to you that you're talking to a human being, but it's actually an automated voice. It just picks up key words that you've asked and res responds and reflects back on it. So the initial part of the vetting of your query is taken care of by a chatbot. Again, I go back to my point, elimination of jobs, right? It's taking away human intervention, so therefore it's taking away someone's job. But that's reality. The cloud. I'm guessing most of you are using the cloud. Most of you will continue to use the cloud and will start adding to the cloud. But again, just a word of caution, there are serious issues on privacy and security that you need to contend with. So be careful. IoT. Amazon is currently working on a concept by which they can deliver to your home. Not in India, because it's not allowed in India. But in the US, where you can use a drone to deliver a product to you. Imagine, you wake up in the morning, there's this drone flying overhead, figuring out your house, comes in and deposits a piece of a package at your, at your doorstep. There is a new theory about post offices globally having certain um, uh, indications on your, on, your, on your letterbox or your postbox and using drones to deliver an envelope into your box. And the moment that envelope has hit your box, there's a sensor at the bottom which recognizes something has hit it and you get a message in your phone saying there's a mail in your box, a real mail in your box. Fantastic, right? So you don't have to go and open your mailbox every day. You open it only when you're told you have something there. You've got mail. Automated cars, adaptive road lay layouts. You know, how many of us use the Google Maps today, right? Almost all of us, I mean, um, you know, you, you're gonna get lost at some point or the other. And Google Maps is something that we're using on a, on a regular basis. Here's something that, that'll interest those, you've, those of you who've bought uh, Bitcoins and those who haven't may get tempted to. Cryptocurrency. Two thousand and thirteen, one billion dollars of cryptocurrency. Two thousand and seventeen to date, one hundred and forty six billion dollars. Can you believe that? 
from 1 billion to 146 billion. This is the pace, the dramatic pace at which technology disruption is happening. There is $146 billion of valuation on cryptocurrency today as compared to 1 billion four years ago, just four years ago. I was telling you technology disrupts every 10 years, every five years, look at the pace of disruption here. And those of you who may have bought it in 2013, you can figure out the valuations today if you've held on to it. Phenomenal. And it's not just Bitcoin. Bitcoin, of course, is the most known or the most recognized of cryptocurrencies and, of course, the largest one. But there's Ethereum, there's Ripple, there's Litecoin, there's Dash, and so many others coming up now. There's actually a market for Bitcoins today. There's an app where you can trade on Bitcoins. There's a whole market. It's like a share market, stock market, Bitcoin market. So what's the impact on digital? And I'm getting to wrapping up now. So I'll go to two segments, the impact of digital, and then I'll focus a little bit on education and how digital is impacting education as well. So here are some products we used to use a, a while ago, at least I used to, no longer exist today. So the first one is a pager. I'm sure most of you have never even seen one. <laughs> a video cassette recorder, the Polaroid camera, a transistor, a typewriter. Oh, we do see typewriters still in the, in the legal space. The telephone with the dial. And all of that is getting compacted today. You have a smart TV. And I remember this Apple ad uh, a few years ago, you know, when they were trying to demonstrate why buy an Apple product. And they showed the, a side view of an Apple, a MacBook, as compared to a computer, and you know, it was, the computer was like this, and the MacBook is as slim as, you know, two folded hands. And they were trying to demonstrate how technology has changed the world we live in. You have a smart watch today, where you can read an email on your watch, and also calculate the number of steps you take whilst you're reading the mail. Incredible. So what next? This is the speed of disruption. The radio, when it was launched, took 38 years, 38 years to reach 50 million users. Three and a half, three, almost four decades to reach 50 million users. The television took 13 years. Internet took four years. Facebook took three and a half years to reach 50 million customers. Instagram reached 50 million customers in six months. Six months, 50 million users. And Instagram is almost obsolete now. <laughs> so that's what disruption is doing to us. So what's the big question here? How can we anticipate the unexpected threats brought on by technological advances that could devastate and destroy business? It's all about timing. Disruption occurs when a new approach meets the right conditions. And these conditions are always changing because technology, of course, accelerates change. You must have the right solution, but if the wrong conditions exist in your market, disruption won't work. Finally, let's look at the last component of this session, which is on education. And how is education being disrupted by digital disruption? So here are some of the leading trends in e-learning. Mobile learning apps. You can actually take courses on your mobile phone through e-learning. Gamification and learning. Videos, interactive videos and virtual reality. Another medium of learning. A little more expensive today, but over a period of time, as the number of users start increasing, this will again come down and become cheaper. Collaborative learning platforms. They exchange ideas on problem solving. It's almost like crowdsourcing learning. Digital learning for students to interact online. You can actually interact online. So for example, if I wanted to take a, a, an advanced lesson on guitar and 
you know, I just wanted to do it at my convenience, I can log into a platform where there is a guitar teacher in the US who will log in at the same time as I do, and I can have an interactive session online. Again, you can decide the term, the, the timing, maybe one hour, one and a half hours, pre-plan it so that that person is also prepared for a one and a half hour session. And you can have an interactive session sitting at your home. Fantastic, right? Advanced analytic measures data and regarding learning patterns. So again, when you're looking at mobile learning apps, when you're, when you're evaluating courses that you want to take, analytics is working out what would be the best courses for you based on the courses that you've already selected. So you don't have to go through a million um, e-learning solutions. It focuses on the ones based on the patterns that you've seen to tell you what is best and most relevant for you. Personalized learning, customized one-on-one -on -one solutions and one-on-one -on -one attention. Again, same like digital learning online. Here are some edtech companies disrupting the future of education. So there's Udemy, which has online classes. There's Voxy, DonorsChoose.org, which is an education crowdfunding source. Exec Online, which provides corporate education for, for executives who don't have the time during the day to you know, do any e-learning. It provides you offline um, with MIT, Sloan, Berkeley's, et cetera, even I think even Howard is on that. Classroom Collaboration, which is Kramer, and Story2, which is college admissions. I'm sure I'm gonna see a lot of you tonight going to look at Story2 and see what that offers. Let's close with a session on the 21st leaders of tomorrow, 21st century leaders of tomorrow, which is you. What will leadership look like 20 years from now? It'll be about questions, not answers. It'll be about leaders who have the ability to ask the right questions. Not provide the right answers, but ask the right kind of questions. It's about the employee pull. Who can pull the best people? What kind of environment can you offer that will bring in the best and brightest talent? Similarly with customer pull, the four Ps of marketing, which is price, product, place, and promotion, will be controlled by an overriding factor, which is personalization. Great marketers will be replaced by great marketplace managers. Chaos learning, learning out of the comfort zone. And finally, business will be driven by purpose. Purpose will be based on the leaders who will believe that the missions that offer the chance will have the maximum dramatic positive impact on business. And I'll close with a quote from Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Thank you. Any questions? Um, do we have time for questions? We do? Yeah, happy to take some. Any questions? Good morning, sir. Sir, here. Yep. So my name is Mehul. I'm a HR student. I wa you talked about analytics uh, as well as automation. So I want to know uh, from, you, uh, from your perspective, in future, uh, what all HR functions are going to get automa uh, automated, as well as what is the future scope for HR analytics? So what will get um, automated is obviously things that can be done on a routine basis, right? So um, basic filtering. Also, for example, if you're a you know HR person in a in a financial services industry, right? So if you have got digital CVs that are coming into you, automatically those CVs can get filtered using analytics and robotics to focus only on those CVs that matter to you for that particular purpose. So there will be keyword identification. So the analytics will pick up the keywords in those CVs that are relevant for that particular position or that particular job and throw up only those CVs to you. So what, what will happen is, instead of having three people filter through 500 or 1,000 CVs at a time, you will get this done in an hour by analytics and robotics. So that's one, one thing. 
um, and e-learning. Um, it's taking over, you know, the normal traditional training sessions that we have. You're just having people learn at their own convenience. So for example, if you want somebody to learn a certain skill and you don't want it done in office hours, that person can go home in the weekend and go through that e-learning curriculum that will help them get to the next level of their job. So again, the use of analytics to find out what is the most important course or most important segment that that person needs to learn can be filtered out, thrown to that employee, and you give them a timeline, him or her a timeline, in which they, they need to complete it. So these are some of the things that, that will get automated. Uh, and again, analytics is going to be used all throughout. You're going to be using it for selection of people. You're going to be using it more and more for appraisal of people. So it'll become a more systematic, perfect science in terms of how to appraise a person as well, which is very important in an HR function. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Morning. Uh, sir, I'm Monisha Chavla from Finance. So my question is, as with the upcoming technologies, do you really think that internal knowledge will look more be existing in future? Because of the technology coming into place, will the internal auditors or the internal audit department will be there in a company? Absolutely. Because uh, we, we use significant technology in internal audit today. Uh, we use a, a phenomenal amount of analytics in everything that we do. So that and can be done by machines also. It can be done, but you can't take the judgment in, in the machine, right? The judgment is of people. So the skill set of an internal auditor will be the ability to use your judgment, your ability to be able to comprehend a variety of information and then predict a certain outcome. And the internal audit uh, of the future will obviously be something that will be of uh, value driven to the, to the management, um, providing value, but more importantly, making sure that controls and, and uh, processes within the organization are, are there and, and you know, working effectively. Uh, yes, robotics will help you in terms of being able to do the routine stuff. So you'll probably have to do it with a lesser workforce. But you can't take away the human judgment. That's the only thing that will keep jobs going, is judgment, until the machine learns to replicate human judgment. Yeah. One last question. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, hello, sir. This is Varsha Sahai. As you mentioned in one of your slides, uh, that management diversity is... Uh, one of the threats uh, mentioned by the CEO of top 500 companies, can you please elaborate how it can be a threat, management diversity? So it's, it's not a threat, it's a trend. It's a trend that's, that uh, is increasing. Um, like I said, there were about 4.8% of Fortune 500 uh, CEOs were women. Uh, that's an increasing trend. Uh, CIOs are, are about 17.8%, which is also an increasing trend. And diversity is extremely important because it brings in a, a, a more wider and diverse perspective into the business. And it's something that all organizations today are striving for. Other areas you mentioned whether uh, cyber threats and uh, the other technological threats. And uh, together with that, you mentioned um, uh, the management diversity. So I was not able to uh, get that. How you can stay uh, together with these? I just answered that question for you. It's important to have more diversity. You don't want, want a, um, a team full of only men in a room. Yeah, you want to have a diverse group that allows a different point of view. And today in the world that we live in, we're looking at race, culture, religion, et cetera. You want to make sure that there's a diverse group that takes decisions so that everyone's interests are kept in mind. And more importantly, the workforce of the future demands that everyone gets an equal opportunity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are grateful for the time, effort you took to share your thoughts and experience. We absorbed the idea you shared with us that companies who embrace technology will only sustain. And that also applies to us. Further, how important is the customer service and moving up with the technology? We take this as a learning from, your, sir, from you, sir, that we should never stop learning and never stop being a learner. Thank you, sir.